Um, for our main presentation, let me introduce John Go Groot Myers to help us better understand the fungal tree of life. At our best, when the Ma identifies the route teaching you about mushrooms, we try for some precision to use the Latin binomials. Uh, so you can um, uh, get a better sense of what it is that you're looking at. Where we are is operating on the evolutionary tree out towards the thin outermost branches of genus and species. Uh, I consider I'm doing well when I occasionally learn that a familiar mushroom has been moved to a new genus, such as the recent movement of the very common ringless honey mushrooms out of our malaria to a new genus, Desar malaria, and possible assignment of a new species name, Cespitosa, which I think refers to the cespitose nature of the clusters. Um, and it was based on examining a specimen collected in, uh, among others, uh, south of Dayton, Ohio. I mentioned that because um, Django originally, John Go did originally, um, work at Ohio State University, and this would not have been too far away. And he's presently working on his PhD in mycology at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He is also working as a research assistant in Dr. Brandon Matheny's lab. His lab has a reputation for work that established RNA polymerase, polymerase uh, genes as major markers in the fun fungal systematics, which is to say, um, trying to figure out what parts of the genetic structure you're looking at when you're doing DNA analysis. I noticed that John Go previously was a research assistant at Ohio State University in a lab that did, among other things, sequencing from grant with grants from Fundus, which is previously known as Mycoflora. He's very active on the Mushroom Observer, among other things, credited with creating over 400 names and another four, and editing another 400 names on Mushroom Observer. So I suspect Django and his friends bear some responsibility for the taxonomic turmoil that we amateurs are suffering through right now. What Jongo is going to describe to us is, I think, the larger tree uh, of um, uh, fungi that helps explain the um, uh, evolutionary sources of the great diversity that we see out in the, uh, in the field. So take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, uh, I'm not going to be making too much of a mess with your uh, identifications in the future. but. We'll see how that works out. All right, let me go ahead and share. Can you guys see me, see this? Yep. Um, it looks like you, yep, there good you go. job. All right, cool. So I will be giving you a brief tour of the fungal tree of life. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the idea of a speed run, it's kind of more of a speed run. Uh, there's one takeaway you should have from my presentation, it's that there are too many fungi, and that's a good thing. So uh, first off, uh, this is not part of the fungal tree of life. This is me. Uh, I'm an animal and not a fungus, although they are fairly close. Um, like John said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, from Ohio originally. And I am interested in fungal systematics. And that's how fungi are related to other fungi. Um, especially the family Porophyllaceae, which has been described as a poorly delimited family full of poorly known genera. And that's true. We'll get to some of those later. All right. So what's going to be important to understanding a tree of life is the idea of tree thinking. So you're kind of looking at this tree metaphor to kind of like graphically describe how things are related to each other. So um, like a real tree, the ends of the tree, and I'll show you some of those in a bit, are called leaves or tips. And those represent the living organisms that we're analyzing. And together, all of those living tips or leaves make up the crown of the tree. Um, points where branches meet are called nodes. And those represent 
inferred ancestors. So things that, you know, here we're dealing with living organisms and we don't have a lot of fossil fungi and we don't have DNA for fossil fungi, certainly. So can't really know what the ancestors were, but we can kind of get some general ideas about them. So the trees we're going to be looking at are called phylogenetic trees or cladograms, dendrograms, phylograms. Um, there are some slight differences between those things, but for our purposes, they're basically the same. So these are kind of like genealogical trees, but a little bit less messy. And I'll show what you mean, what I mean uh, here in a second. So this is a not particularly good screenshot of my uh, genealogy on ancestry.com. So you can see what I mean about it being messy. So over here, this is me. And then, you know, I have a mom and a dad and they have their own trees and it gets old. You look at it and it's a little bit confusing. Um, when you're looking at a phylogeny here, you're really only looking at assuming kind of one ancestor, even though that's not exactly what happened. Um, so in the tree, and this is a simplified version of you know, you could say your family tree. Here's me, and I'm most closely related to my cousin. And this node here, oh, sorry, most closely related to my sibling. And this node here is a parent. It doesn't really matter which one it is. You could say, this is my dad. Uh, and then we're equally closely related to my cousin. And then this is a grandparent, second cousin, great grandparent, and so on. So you're getting closer to this point, which is the root of the tree. You're going further back in time, the older and older ancestors. And this is how uh, trees for other organisms will work too. So if you look at this, uh, this is kind of a simplified tree of life. Here you have fungi and animals, which are actually more closely related to each other than they are to plants. And then all of those are more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria. And then you get to this root, which is all of life, the last universal common ancestor of everything on earth. So way, 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 way back in time. Um, all right, so then what are fungi? So they're members of the kingdom fungi, which is true by definition. Fungi are fungi, of course. Um, so you may have seen in old textbooks, they're called plants. They're not, they're sort of plant-like, they're sessile, and they don't really, you know, get up and walk around and move like animals do. Um, they don't have a lot else in common with plants. They're heterotrophic. So plants are autotrophic. And they get their, they make their own nutrients through photosynthesis. Uh, fungi sort of have to eat like us, although they do it in a different way. Um, they eat outside of their body. So they dump out enzymes into the environment and soak up nutrients where we kind of take them into our digestive tracts inside of us. Um, they have cell walls containing the substance chitin, mostly. Uh, there are some exceptions. They're made up of hyphae, which are these microscopic tubes, mostly. So there are exceptions to these rules describing what a fungus is. Like most uh, things in biology, every rule has its exception, and every exception has its exception. And we'll get to some of those. So here's a uh, tree of fungi. It's one of the bigger ones, and you can see there's a lot going on here. It's a little, it's a little noisy. You can't see a ton from here, but you have all these kind of basal groups of fungi here. Some of these are the exceptions. What we're going to be doing in this presentation is kind of working our way up from here to the tip, where you have basidiomycetes or an ascomycetes, the higher fungi, the things that we're going to see on your uh, 4A tables. So I'm going to start with the rosella mycota, which is a phylum of fungi that are probably the least fungus-like fungi. There was a while where people weren't really sure they were fungi. Um, they're mostly parasites that live inside of the cells of other organisms. So they could be uh, animals, plants, algae, other fungi. They're mostly single-celled. And for most of their lives, they don't have chitin in their cell walls. Um, and some of them eat their food uh, by engulfing it within their cells and eating it like amoebas do and not like uh, most other fungi do. So they kind of just look like spores of other fungi. You can see here these brown spiny things. And these are actually uh, a rosella inside of the cells of another fungus. Um, and a lot of these are actually aquatic. So like, uh, like animals, fungi started off 
uh, they evolved in the sea way back, probably over a billion years ago. All right, so I'm going to skip a lot of other small groups of uh, primitive fungi and get to one that we might actually see at a foray. So that Entomophthora mycota, which I know is very much a mouthful and probably butchering it. So these are mostly arthropod parasites. Um, and some of them cause pretty complicated behavior changes, or we call it mind control. There are some other groups of fungi that do this too. Um, they have hyphae, they're tube-like uh, structures, make them up, but they don't have uh, septi, these walls inside them, like more derived or advanced uh, fungi do. I'll show you some pictures of those in a bit, but here's uh, an example that we might have seen over this summer with brood X. Mesospora cicadena, aka the flying salt shaker of death. And this is an excellent photo by John Plischke. So you can see here's the cicada. And at the back here, this is the fungus. So it infects the cicada and they actually can infect them as a nymph. And they might be within the cicada for years and years until they emerge from the ground. And then uh, after the cicada emerges, it starts eating away at it. Um, from the inside and eventually uh, basically replaces its abdomen, like part of the cicada's body just falls off and the fungus forms this kind of white plug where it shakes spores. So as the cicadas are flying around, they're shaking spores all over the ground that will infect uh, the next generation of cicadas. So that's why flying sh salt shaker of death, because they're, you know, shaking the spores that will kill cicadas further down the line. Um, and what's really interesting about this too is that the fungus produces uh, chemicals that alter the mind of the cicada. So they produce uh, cathinone, which is actually an amphetamine and apparently makes the cicadas unaware that they're missing a big part of their body for quite a while until they die. Um, and the cicadas will actually try to mate with each other when they're infected. So this uh, is also a fungal STD. Uh, be glad none of ours are quite this nasty. Um, so now we're going to skip a lot of other things and we'll go to Dicaria, the higher fungi. Uh, this is a subkingdom of fungi. Most of these are made out of hyphae, which you can see these are hyphae of Dicaria on a petri dish. Not quite close enough to really see the structure, but they have these septi or cross walls that uh, isolate different portions of their hyphae from each other. And they have a more uh, complex mating system and they contain the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes. So here you can see these are hyphae of a dicarian fungus, specifically athelia. You can see these cross walls here. These are the septi. All right, and the different groups of dicaria are uh, differentiated based on their reproductive structures. So they have the basidiomycetes, which produce their spores on these basidia. These are these club-like structures with little spikes on the tips, and the spores are produced on the ends of spikes. And the ascomycetes, the spores are produced in these sacs. Usually there are eight of them, and usually there are four herbicidium and basidiomycetes. All right, so we're gonna start with the ascomycetes. Uh, like I said earlier, they have spores produced in these sac-like asci. There's usually eight of them, sometimes only one, sometimes in some uh, dung ascomycetes, that'll be a couple thousand per ascus. And at that point, it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at. Uh, it's probably the most diverse fungal phylum. A lot of them are plant pathogens. Uh, yeah, if you look at this here, there are a lot of different groups of ascomycetes. All of these are different ascomycete orders, and there are way more orders and classes of ascomycetes than there are basidiomycetes. So this is a pretty primitive group of ascomycetes, the Tafarina mycota. So these are mostly plant parasites that cause galls on plants. And then within these galls, they just produce the asci directly on the plant surface. Uh, so this is Tafrina robinsoniana that grows on alder. Uh, this might turn up at a foray, and you might get other Tafrinas turning up on peaches. Uh, some of these are important plant pathogens. But Neolecta, which looks like an earth tongue, but is not at all, is also related to these. And it's the only mushroom-forming group 
in this big group of ascomycetes. These are pretty weird. And these definitely will show up at 4As. This is Neolecta regularis. So the Pizizomycotina contain uh, the more derived ascomycetes, most of the fleshy ones. Um, I'm skipping over uh, bread yeasts, the Saccharomycotina. Sorry, uh, beer brewers, but they're, they're not really mushrooms. And we're not really going to see them at 4As. So one order within this is the Pizziza aliis or the operculate cup fungi. So an aliis ending on a name, uh, A-L-E-S for fungi is for orders. Um, so this is the order of the operculate cup fungi. They have uh, at the tips of their asci these little lids that open up to release the spores where most other ascomyces simply have like a, a hole that they come out of the center. Um, the asci have one wall and release them through these lids. This is a pretty beautiful example, Microstoma flocosum, which might show up uh, at your forays in the late spring or early summer. It's pretty small, they're about that big, but I always love finding these. And then morels, we have Morchella diminutiva, one of our smaller morels, probably one of the more charismatic disease ailies. Uh, I think you guys know these are great to eat. I love finding these. Also truffles or true truffles, species of the genus tuber. Uh, this one right here is tuber longusporum. Actually, uh, I found this right outside of my work at Ohio State. And this is actually uh, related to uh, tuber estivum, which is a pretty valuable European truffle. And these are actually pretty delicious. So we do have some pretty good uh, native eating truffles, even if they're poorly known. And uh, they are pretty difficult to find though. Usually the best way to find truffles is to scare off squirrels. So this is what it looked like after I scared away a squirrel. You see where the squirrel has been digging and a little part where it's chewed on part of it. See, it's pretty small and similar to the dirt color, but you kind of have to dig around it uh, and then get it out. And often they smell pretty strongly when you get up close to them. So you can kind of smell there's a truffle even when you can barely see it. So they have um, these asci here, which actually don't open to release the spores on their own. Um, they're relying on an animal to eat them and digest away the ascus and the spores come out and are spread in the dung. And these are the spores here. They're these very thick walled kind of honeycomb looking things, which uh, can withstand being digested by mammals, usually rodents, which is pretty cool. If you look at them really close, they're Pretty beautiful. I really like looking at truffle spores. All right, so we're going to get to another order of ascomycetes, the geoglossales. These are the real earth tongues, except for microglossum and the electa, which are completely different. Uh, they're pretty much all club shaped. They have long spores. A lot of them are brown and have septa within them. Um, the asci have a single wall and they don't open by the operculum, like the uh, disease ailies. So here's Trichoglossum octopartitum. You can see they have these very long, skinny spores. These are brown and they have these septa across them, these cross walls. Usually these are pretty easy to see uh, at low magnification. So uh, earth tongues are a pretty good place to start if you're getting into microscopy. They're pretty easy to identify and pretty satisfying. Uh, here's a glutinoglossum species that I found this summer, which is very slimy earth tongue, pretty large. Then the Lecanoromycetes, I'm mostly going to be skipping over. Lichens are cool, but not really what I focus on. But this is Lecanoromycete Atholia holocarpa, which these uh, orange things here are the ascocarps. It almost looks like there's, it's not a lichen because it kind of just, uh, the thallus is kind of inside the wood. But uh, this group, Lecanoromycetes, are pretty cool because under the microscope, if you put them in Melzer's reagent, uh, almost the whole surface turns like a beautiful blue, um, which is really nice to see. It's the tips of the asci that turn blue. And they have, um, in this group, they have spores that uh, it might be hard to see, but they kind of have like an X uh, shape inside of them. You can see there a little bit, they're pretty cool. All right, so the Dithidiomycetes are another huge group of ascomycetes. 
Um, and I should say this seats ending, except for ascomycetes, it usually means it's a, it's a fungal class. You could say seats or CDs. Um, so these have bitunicate asci, which means they have two walls and the one wall kind of splits open and releases the other ascus wall, kind of opens like a jack in the box. Um, their asci often produced in these flask shaped structures or pseudothesia. Um, and this also includes a lot of important mold genera. Um, here's a really beautiful one that you might see uh, at some of your forays. It's Ritidhistron ruffulum, has these beautiful uh, red cups with black pleated margins. And uh, you'll often see this uh, under Osage orange. So this is on an Osage orange stick. Pretty cool one. Uh, Patellaria atrata, these funky little black ones that grow on uh, sticks. Usually they grow on dry sticks high up in trees and they fall down in storms. They're not, not the most photogenic, but ecologically pretty interesting. Um, and they, you can see here, this is the Patellaria atrata. You can see the two ascus walls. So here's the one, the inside wall and the outside wall of an immature ascus. So this top layer will split open and release the spores. And here's a spore. All right, so the Leoshomycetes, these are a bit more derived than the Ascomycetes, uh, includes a lot of plant pathogens, cup fungi, bunch of oddballs. Uh, they have unitunicate, which is one-walled asci, and they're in a percolate. They don't open with that, uh, that little door. So here's an example, arachnophysiza trebinoloides, beautiful, hairy, bright orange cup on wood. Uh, rarely documented, but it might show up at some of your forays. It's, it's native. Uh, Microgrossum viridi, which is an earth dung, not in the geoglossomyces. It's beautiful green earth tongue. This is a Bolinidium species I recently found in Tennessee. I'm not sure which species, but these beautiful purple stains, another hairy cup. A lot of the small hairy cups are in the Leuchomycetes. So we'll get the end. So Dariomycetes, um, these also produce asci in flask-shaped structures like the uh, Dithidiomycetes, and these are called Parathesia rather than pseudothesia. The distinction is mainly what the asci inside of those flasks look like. And this is very much an uh, artificial distinction. So not really to necessary to remember it, don't worry. That won't be on the test at the end. Uh, so these produce unitunicate asci. That's again, it means one walled, one tunic, one wall. Um, includes a lot of important plant and insect pathogens, some wood decomposers. These are sometimes referred to the flask fungi, but that can also include uh, some dithidiomycetes and uh, other small groups. So one uh, pretty uh, charismatic uh, representative is this Ophiocordyceps, specifically Ophiocordyceps Kim Flemingiae. This is one I recently found in Tennessee. So this is uh, in the group of Ophiocordyceps referred to as the zombie fungi. So you may have seen some tropical representatives of this group in a nature documentary. This is another group of fungi that control the minds of their insect hosts. So what this will do is it'll infect uh, carpenter ants. And then as it grows inside them, it causes them to uh, grow, uh, climb up a tree onto the underside of twigs bite into the twigs and stay there until they die. And then once they've died, the, uh, the fungus will erupt from the back of its head, you can see here, and then produce spores and the spores will fall down from the tree branches. And some of the species in this group, they actually differ mainly in how they control the behavior of their host. So this one causes them to bite into twigs, other species cause them to bite into leaves or the inside of rotten logs. It's pretty complex behavior changes there. It's pretty wild. So here are their parathesia, these flasks where the spores are produced. And you can see the spores are coming out here. So this is Xylaria corniformis, um, one of the prettier Xylaria. And you can see these little pimple looking things on it. These are the parathesia, the flasks where the spores are produced. 
and Hypomyces lactiflorum is another Sordaria mycete. These white spots are where their spores are being produced. And uh, these are the lobster mushrooms, of course, one of my favorite edibles, uh, certainly one that's shown up at some of your forays. Always wonderful to find. Maybe one of the more delicious Sordaria mycetes. All right, we'll get to my favorite group, maybe the Basidia mycetes. Sorry, uh, ask a mycete people. So these produce their sexual spores or myospores on the basidia, the club-shaped structures. Usually there are four of them, sometimes as few as one, sometimes up to 12, and some things related to chanterelles. Um, and their hyphae can have these things called clamp connections, although they don't always. Uh, this is a difference they have with ascomycetes. You can see this thing here where there's the septum and there's this clamp. Only uh, basidiomycetes have that. And so here's the basidiomycete tree. You can see a lot fewer classes, a lot fewer orders. So we're going to go through some of those here. Not everything, sorry, there's too many. All right, so we have the Pacinia mycota or the rusts. They have, um, as Megan was mentioning earlier, they have a complex multi stage life cycle and they can have up to five different types of spores. Um, most of them are plant pathogens. Sometimes they have different hosts. They spend different parts of the life cycles in. And mostly they have these uh, transverse septic basidia, which look kind of like, uh, like if you split a hot dog in four and it has these spikes that come off the side that produce the spores. Not really a regular looking basidium. They're, they're pretty odd. Um, this is one you might get in the spring, Puccinia Maria Wilsonia, which grows on the underside of spring beauty leaves. Is these, looks like these pretty little sunflowers. And this one is quite a bit different. It's a Puccinia mycete, but not really a rust. It's Helicoglia compressa, these gray blobs on wood. So it's not a plant pathogen, not orange, and it produces, as far as we know, only one type of spore. So. Not really anything like the rest, but it's in that group. All right, so the Ustalaginomycetes are another big group of kind of primitive basidiomycetes. These are also mostly plant pathogens with transverse septic basidia. Um, their life cycles are less complicated than the Pachiniomycetes. They usually only have two types of spores, and, and a lot of them are more on the brown or black end of things rather than orange. So for example, Ustalago mitis or corn smut, which uh, is pretty charismatic. Uh, some of you may have eaten them. I have not. I found it a couple times, but this was growing uh, at Ohio State on an experimental plot where this corn was uh, fertilized with human manure. Uh, I did not feel like getting E. coli, so I didn't eat it, but you theoretically could. Um, Exobasidium rhododendra is another example of a, a fungus in this group, although it's not exactly a smut. Um, it causes these kind of bubblegum looking galls on rhododendron. Uh, these could certainly show up at your forays. Pretty neat. All right, so we're getting to the more derived basidium mycetes, the Agarica mycotina. So Based on these other groups they're related to, it probably evolved from some sort of rust or smut-like plant pathogen. Uh, the basidia shape is very variable. Most of them are not plant pathogens. Uh, and they're very morphologically diverse and have some of the most complicated fruiting bodies uh, out of any fungus. All right, so a lot of the, the primitive groups of the Gericomycotin are different types of jelly fungi. So we have the uh, tremelomycetes, contain a lot of the jellies. Um, and uh, a lot of these have yeast-like stages in their life cycles. So they contain most of the basidiomycete yeasts, and they have these cruciate septate basidia, which means they have a cross-shaped uh, septums in them, which I'll show you here in a bit. They look quite a bit different than um, most other basidia shapes, but there are exceptions. So there are these genera Cyzygospora and Carcinomyces that have pretty much regular looking club shaped basidia. Um, a lot of these are parasites on other fungi, including lichens, although there's some uh, preliminary research that suggests that some of these might actually be mutualists with lichens, although 
it's, uh, don't tell anyone I told you that that hasn't been published yet, but interesting stuff in the pipe on these. Yeah, so these are the cruciate septate basidia that characterize a lot of these. So if you're looking at it from the side, you can see they have this septum, this wall across them. They're kind of a uh, sphere shaped. These are the sterigmata, the spikes, the spores are produced on. They're pretty long. Um, if you're looking at it from the top of it, you can see um, if you're not looking at these uh, sterigmata here, they have kind of a rough cross shape in the top. So that's why it has the name cruciate septate, the cross shaped septum. And here, this is from Tremella and Fia Tremella, which are representatives of this group. And here we have Tremella, Tremella mesenterica, or witch's butter, which this one is a, a parasite on uh, Bacidiomyces in the family Paneophoraceae. So this here is Dendrophora albobadia. And the uh, Tremella is actually parasitizing its hyphae inside of the stick and then fruiting off of it. Um, and you can actually eat these. Uh, a lot of the jellies are edible. Um, I find with Tremella, they, it doesn't really have much of a taste, but it's got a great texture. So pretty nice. If you find a fresh one in the woods, just pick it off a stick and kind of snack on it. It's a nice one. And this is another uh, Tremella mice. Carcinomyces afibulatus, which causes uh, galls on Gymnopus triophilus. So there's this other fungus, Cyzygospora mycetophila, which causes a similar, but looks fairly different, but it's also in this group. So here you can see these are its basidia. Um, these aren't zoomed in very far, but you can see they're kind of a normal club shaped thing with the four spikes on top. It is pretty normal basidia, uh, oddly enough, for being in this group. All right, so another group of jellies are the dacromycetes. So these are also mostly jellies, but it contains some crusts. And they have, if you can see over here, they have these tuning fork shaped basidia. So it's kind of a long cylinder and they fork into two at the top. Um, there is one example where it only produces one spore and then it doesn't look like a tuning fork, but most of them do. And the spores often become septate like this, where they split into four and they produce uh, asexual spores off of the side before they really germinate. And these are called blastokinidia. And those are pretty cool to see under the microscope. All right, so the agaricomycetes are kind of the more derived basidiomycetes. And these contain most of them with the simple or normal basidia. That's the normal club shaped thing with four spikes on the top. Um, its common ancestor was probably some sort of jelly, as there are some jellies within the agaricomycetes. For example, within this group, the cantharellales, which is pretty primitive within the agaricomycetes, um, which includes the chanterelles, but it also includes a lot of things with a bunch of different weird types of basidia, and some of them produce up to 12. So some of these produce the most uh, spores per basidium, any basidium I see. And it contains gilled mushrooms, toothy fungi, corals, jellies, crusts, and polypores. It's super morphologically diverse. And kind of a running theme here is a lot of these groups produce a bunch of different morphologies. And it's kind of hard to figure out how things are related to each other uh, simply based on morphology. So a lot of these things are more united by uh, genetics than anything else. Yeah, for example, here is uh, Cantharella chicagoensis, which is one of our uh, native chanterelles. This is from uh, Ohio. You probably have it in the DC area as well, but I'm not sure it's been documented from there yet. Um, it's a little different from other chanterelles in that when it's young, the uh, cap margins are a little bit greenish, although in this case, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, chanterelles are pretty difficult to tell apart from each other, but fortunately they're all delicious. So usually don't really have to identify them to species that eat them. And then we have uh, Hiddenum also in this group, Hiddenum aristatosporum. These are the hedgehogs, which look quite a bit like if you uh, made a chanterelle kind of turn down the color and put spikes on the bottom of the cap or teeth, which is pretty much what it is. They're fairly closely related to chanterelles and the texture is pretty uh, similar. They're also delicious. 
And under the microscope, they're pretty similar also. We also have Tulasnella violia in this group, which uh, is a jelly. It's kind of a crust and also a jelly. It's kind of a cool, bright purple jelly crust that you find on the underside of logs. Um, and you'll even find it uh, growing in the winter. So some of these crust and jellies will keep growing through the winter because they're kind of insulated on the bottom of logs, um, kind of protected from the cold, unlike their uh, more complicated uh, fruiting body relatives, like the chanterelles. And this is actually a tree symbiont. And um, a lot of these tulasnellas ah, are also uh, symbiotic with orchids. It's pretty interesting. So the Sebastinales are another order of the uh, agaricomycetes that are kind of jelly-like, although they're kind of jelly corals, pretty tough. They're mostly ectomycorrhizal uh, tree symbionts. They also have these, <coughs> excuse me, cruciate septid uh, basidia, like tr the tremelomycetes. So here we have tremelodendron tenax, which is uh, pretty similar to our tr uh, tremelodendron schweinitzii, the more common one. Um, and these kind of will become like a mushroom weed in the summer. They show up all the time and they're cool, but eventually you get kind of too used to them. Right, the Hymenochidales are another kind of primitive group of agaricomycetes, but they don't contain any jellies. This can, includes uh, polypores, crusts, gilled mushrooms, toothy fungi. They don't really have anything in common other than uh, DNA, although some of the members have this uh, reaction called the xanthoproic reaction, where if you drop uh, potassium hydroxide or lye on them, they turn uh, black. They also often have these uh, brown, thick-walled spiny structures under the microscope called CD. So here's a pretty classic example, Inonotus cuticularis. So this one does have that reaction where if you drop potassium hydroxide on it, it turns black. And then also it has these CD. So this is a pretty complicated example. This is uh, from the cap surface of that Inonotus. This is a CD, but it's uh, branched, kind of looks like an antler. And so these are pretty distinctive in this group. They're pretty beautiful. And this is also from an Inonotus, but this is a more normal example. It's kind of just a brown, thick walled spike. So a lot of members of this order have those, but unfortunately not all of them. So for example, we have this here, Ricanella swartzii, which looks nothing like the Inonotus. It's a pretty normal looking mushroom. It does not have CD. It does not have that reaction. But DNA tells us it's in that group, which is pretty surprising. It's not at all like any of those. And we also have Pinaeophorella. This is probably an undescribed Pinaeophorella species from Ohio, which also does not have that xanthochroic reaction, that it doesn't turn black with potassium hydroxide. It doesn't have CD, but it's also in that group. And these are pretty weird. Uh, a lot of crusts like this, they kind of just look like a like white paint on wood, because they're kind of the, the most simple uh, basidia mycete uh, spore producing structure you can have. It's really just basidia and some other things directly on the wood they're growing on. So they don't really invest much energy in producing a mushroom, um, but they can be pretty ecologically diverse and do some pretty weird things and produce some pretty weird structures under the microscope, even if they don't really look like much to the naked eye. So this Pinaeophorella is definitely an example of that because this is actually uh, are carnivorous fungus. So they produce these structures under the, uh, that you can see under the microscope called echinocysts and stephanocysts. They're basically these little spiky things. Some of them like this, there's a stephanocyst on the side, they're spiky and they have a sticky drop in the center. Um, and so what that'll do is if a nematode or some other uh, small animal passes over it, it gets kind of glued and skewered to it and then the fungus will digest it. So it, as it's producing the spores on the fruiting body, it's also kind of passively catching little animals that pass over it and eating them, which is pretty crafty. 
And uh, it's pretty wild too, because some members of this group, for example, uh, what used to be called Hyphoderma praetermissum, which is now Pineophorella praetermissa, they'll produce these, uh, these nematodes trapping structures sometimes before they even produce hyphae. So you can see as soon as the spores germinate, sometimes they start producing these, which is kind of odd, but uh, it's been speculated that they might do that so that they can kind of uh, latch onto a nematode or something else passing over the parent and they can be dispersed by that nematode to another uh, location, which is pretty cool. And under uh, my low powered microscope, they're not as easy to see, but this right here, this kind of odd egg shaped thing with the dots on the side is a stephanocyst. So this thing is almost definitely carnivorous, which is pretty cool. Another member of this group is Hyphodontia arguta, which is a really pretty uh, white toothy crust. And you'll see this a lot on hardwood logs. It's If you get into crusts, this is kind of like a crust weed, which is kind of nice because it is very pretty. Um, what's distinctive about it is it has these, uh, these sterile cells on its spines that are kind of bottle brush shaped. So once you see those, I kind of know, oh yeah, it's, it's Hyphodontia arguta again. I'm gonna throw it out and stop working on it because if you see it too much, even if it is very pretty. Okay, so the Rusculales are another order uh, within the Agaricomycetes. They include, of course, Ruscula, hence the name. So they include gilled mushrooms, polypores, crusts, corals, toothy fungi, false truffles, a lot of different things. A lot of the members of this group have spores that are called amyloid. Um, and so what that means is they turn blue in uh, Melzer's reagent. So you see here, these are the uh, amyloid spores. So put them in Melzer's reagent, they turn this color. Otherwise they're kind of white or pale brownish. Uh, and this is a russula species here. Drink some water real quick and get back to this. All right. So yeah, this is a russula, pretty typical member of this group. It's a guild mushroom. And this is a red russula. And some of you may know that these are awful to identify. I've heard there may be about 80 red rostulas in uh, North America. Very difficult to ID even with microscopy. There's a, uh, one of my lab mates is working on rostula and I really don't envy him, even if I do think they're pretty cool. I don't know what rostula species is, but I gave this to him and he might figure it out. So we also have Lactarius indigo, which is also pretty typical guild mushroom, but it's, even though it's common, it's really, really beautiful. You know, you don't have as many uh, these bright blue mushrooms and also produces a bright blue latex, which is pretty cool. And then Bondartsevia berkeleyi or Berkeley's polypore is actually not too distantly related to Russula and Lactarius, even though it's a big polypore. Um, <clears throat> not a guild mushroom, but it does have fairly similar spores to them, amyloid spiny spores. And Veraria and Bestians is a crust in this group. It's a pretty common bright yellow, bright orange crust, kind of looks um, glossy. You'll find it on hardwood sticks in the forest and it often kind of binds the sticks together. Um, morphologically, it doesn't really have anything in common with Rosula or Lactarius or Bondartsevia, but it's in that group. Um, so the Thelophoreales, luckily, this is a group that does kind of have things in common, this order. Um, it includes corals, crusts, toothy fungi, and guild mushrooms. And they mostly have spiny spores. They're often pigmented. They often contain the substance called thelophoric acid. So here's a Pretty nice example, Hidnellum scabrosum, which kind of looks like a hedgehog. Um, it has these spines on the underside of the cap. Uh, it often has olive staining on the base of the stem. But if you taste this, you will not mistake it for a hedgehog. Um, it tastes strongly bitter. And on top of that, there, there are some other uh, elements to the taste that are just absolutely disgusting. I think this is 
one of the worst tasting mushrooms I've ever tried, but it's pretty cool under the microscope and it's also pretty good for dyeing, uh, dyeing wool that is. This is Thelophora sicilis, which is a coral. It's rarely documented. I found this uh, in the Monongahela uh, with spruce. And it's what's uh, distinctive about this species. It's kind of a dark purplish black and it has little tiny spines on the bottoms of the stems. So if you find this, uh, I'm definitely interested. It's pretty rare. You can see here it's spores under the microscope are spiny, and that's pretty typical of this group. Pretty much all of them have some sort of spiny spore. Here's a Tomentella species, also from West Virginia. So these are very closely related to the Thelophoras, but they're crusts. This one is a nice kind of uh, grayish blue. This one's actually probably unnamed. The Polyporiales uh, are closely related to the Thelophoriales, probably, and they include most of the polypores, it's hence the name, but not all of them. They also include a lot of things that aren't polypores. For example, crusts, toothy fungi, gild mushrooms. Most of these are wood decomposers and they include some of our uh, most important wood decomposing fungi. And they're pretty well documented uh, because of that. A lot of forestry mycologists have worked on these. So here we have Lidoporus conifericola, which is one of our chicken of the woods species. This one uh, only grows on conifers. So if you see chicken of the woods uh, on hemlock, this is usually on hemlock, it's that and not our, uh, our native hardwood species, Lidoporus uh, sulfurius, but it's also a good edible, although probably rarely encountered. So this is an Apolyporales, but it's not a polypore. This is Neofavola suavissimus. And this, is, uh, this example is actually from your uh, sequinodophore. It produces these really subtly beautiful white fruiting bodies with uh, kind of gills with jagged edges. It has a very strong anise odor. So that's pretty distinctive about this. It's, I think, one of the best smelling mushrooms I've encountered. And this is what it looks like from the top, kind of whitish, got a little indent in it. And Phlebia acerina is another member of this group. It's not a polypore, although it's kind of polypore-like, kind of a weird wrinkly crust. Here's another weird Phlebia species, Phlebia coccinia fulva, which is pretty beautiful. Definitely is not a polypore, even if it's in this group. So the agaricomycetidae here, these are the more getting toward the crown group uh, fungi that toward the tip of the tree we're working toward. So these include the beletes, most of our guild mushrooms, and a couple weird little groups of uh, crusts. And this tree here is pretty rough. We're not really sure yet how all these different things are related to each other, although we do know they are more closely related to each other than they are to the other groups of deciduomyces. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done here. So some of the more simple members of this group are the orders. Ethyliales and Amylocorticiales. Most of these are crusts and they're pretty simple under the microscope. They produce basidia in these uh, candelabra shaped structures. Um, they include some things that aren't crusts too. They include some polypores, some gild mushrooms, and some just oddballs. Um, they include some weird aquatic things. Some of them are mycorrhizal in the Ethyliales, but uh, they do some pretty interesting things uh, ecologically, and I'll show you an example of that here in a sec. So the termite balls, uh, which is an Athelia species, maybe Athelia termitophila, although what species it is is not exactly clear yet. Uh, and this is also called the cuckoo fungus because these are fungal brood parasites. So the term brood parasite is usually used to describe birds where they lay eggs in another bird's nest and have uh, the other bird raise their uh, offspring. Although this is a fungus that kind of does that. If you see here, these are the termites and these whitish things are the real termite eggs. These brown things are the fungus's sclerotia, which are just a ball of hyphae. And so the termites are tricked that these are eggs and they pick them up and move them 
uh, to other areas of their chambers and they spread the fungus that way. So the fungus kind of tricks the termite into taking care of parts of it as its babies and tricks the uh, termites into raising it, kind of like a cuckoo, which is pretty bizarre. And this is otherwise a wood decomposer, although it's also kind of an insect brood parasite and it tricks specifically reticular term, uh, termites termites. Um, they produce a similar texture on the outside to real termite eggs um, and also potentially some psychoactive chemicals that trick the termites low. I can't really reveal what. There's some ongoing research on that at Ohio State that I think will be pretty exciting when it comes up. So keep an uh, eye out for that. Yeah, and here is a, an example of brood parasitism in birds with cuckoos and cowbirds. You can see the baby that's way too big for the nest. Pretty funny example there. And this is what the, uh, the fruiting body of the Ithelia looks like. It's another pretty normal looking white crust on wood, even though inside of the wood, it's getting up to some pretty bizarre stuff with termites. It's actually pretty common in the US, although rarely documented. And this is what these, the termite balls look like under the microscope. And Plicaturopsis crispa is probably the member of this group you're most likely to find. It's kind of a weird, wrinkly, false turkey tail looking thing. These kind of beautiful undersides. All right, so the bully tailies, these I think some of you might really like to eat, includes all of the bullets, but not just bullets. It also includes some gilled mushrooms and crusts and toothy fungi, puffballs, false truffles and a polypore. Uh, most of them are dark spored, so they do have some things in common. Here we have corcini or the Boletus edulis group, which are delicious. I think some of my favorite mushrooms to eat, they have these uh, distinctive stuffed pores on the underside. So when they're young, the pores are covered with a white layer, which is actually uh, technically a veil. And then they have uh, the reticulated stems where they look like they have a netting. And here's uh, Pseudobolitis parasiticus, which is actually a bolete parasitic on Scleroderma citrinum, which is one of the uh, false puffballs. But uh, Scleroderma is also in the bully tailies. So Scleroderma is a puffball that evolved from a bolete that's in turn parasitized by a different bolete, which is, I think, pretty interesting. You have Pisolithus arenarius, which is in this group. Uh, pretty weird powdery things you'll find under oaks a lot. They have these uh, sacks that are filled with spores. And Pseudomerulius aureus, it's pretty common uh, decomposer on conifers, these nice bright orange wrinkly fruiting bodies. And Lanmaua politerosia, another delicious edible bleed, kind of peachy, pinkish, purplish colors. Uh, smells kind of like beef bouillon. I have a friend that really loves eating these and sometimes they can get huge. I've seen some where the caps are like dinner uh, plate size. And this is what it looks like on the inside is a beautiful blooming reaction. All right, so the agaricales include most of the guild mushrooms and this is the group I'm working on now. Um, well, it's within that. Includes the guild mushrooms, some crusts, corals, polypores, puffballs, false truffles, little tiny cups, tooth fungi, a lot of different things. Uh, it's the most uh, species rich order in the Basidiomyces, also has the most described species out of any order of fungi. And so here's an example of a toothy thing here, Radulomyces coplandii, aka the Asian beauty, possibly introduced from Asia, hence the name, although it's not entirely true. Uh, clear if that's true. And this is definitely something in the, uh, the DC area. I found this example along the Potomac. And another kind of weird toothy thing, this is gliomucro dependence. So these kind of look like uh, little booger icicles, kind of weird yellow gelatinous things. Um, and when they get older, they kind of turn white and just kind of turn to goo and melt. They're pretty bizarre. 
Um, I found these in Tennessee and they seem to be pretty common here, although they're pretty rarely documented. Porothelium fimbriatum is a pretty bizarre thing. It's kind of a crust, although um, on its surface, it produces all these different individual little brown cups. And it might be perennial. It seems to come back year after year. This is actually in the family I study, the porotheliaceae. It's a pretty weird thing. Yeah, you can see, if you zoom in on it, it has this crust surface and all these tiny little brown cups. And there's not a lot else like this out there. There are a couple other groups of fungi that do that, but it's got a pretty strange morphology. That not a lot else does. This is Lintonaria leucobryophila, which is a pretty normal crust other than being bright yellow, and it also has spiny spores, a really pretty one. This is Delicotula integrella, example of a guild mushroom. This is also in the family I study, the Porophiliaceae. It has kind of reduced gills, it's kind of translucent. Um, and it actually has a veil, although it's pretty hard to see unless you're looking at really tiny immature ones. It also seems to grow directly from tree roots, the tree root tips a lot, although it's not really clear why. Something weird ecologically is going on with these, although it's not really clear yet. Um, I tend to work on this a little bit. If Agaricus floridanus, Agaricus is the group that gives this order its name. Pretty typical guild mushroom. Um, these mainly grow in the south, but they also go pretty far up into the east coast, I think up into Massachusetts. So these are bright yellow agaricus and have a nice almond smell. Um, they also have unusually small spores. Uh, Mycene astrum corium is a puffball, not too distantly related to agaricus, despite looking way different. All right, so this is now kind of the end of our tour of the fungal tree of life. So uh, don't worry, not all of this is going to be on the test, uh, but some takeaways we have here. Fungi are super morphologically diverse, as you've seen from the examples I've given here. Um, their order is often also very morphologically diverse. And now with DNA-based research, a lot of them are uh, united by DNA features and not much else, especially for the basidiomycetes. And also there are too many fungi to fit in a 45 minute presentation. And that's kind of a good thing. So I think at this point, I will turn it over to questions. and Stop my uh, screen share here. All right. That was great. Hi everyone, I'm April. I'm gonna be reading off some of these questions that folks had here in no particular Great. order. Um, so let's see, um, you talked, actually there were a few different families that had false truffles and Tom wanted to know what the difference between true and false truffles were. Uh, okay, so this is actually a thing that uh, truffle researchers will argue over quite a bit. So, there are different definitions of that. Some people say a true truffle is just the members of the genus tuber, which includes most of the truffles you would eat. And some people say, actually true truffles are uh, things that produce truffle-like fruiting bodies. And what that means is they're, they produce their uh, fruiting bodies underground and they produce the spores on the inside. Um, and they, they limit that to things that do that, that are ascomycetes. Um, but the, the distinction is really artificial. So there are some people that say, um, actually all false truffles are real truffles. So there's this guy, Marcos Kayafa in Florida who says that. So that's, that's kind of a can of worms there, but for the sake of this presentation, what I mean is false truffles are truffle-like things that are basidiomycetes um, is what I mean when I say it. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Earlier, when you were talking about the flying salt shaker, shaker of death, um, Shane Alexander wanted to know if the massospora spores do anything to humans. 
No, not that we know of. Although, well, if you ate the massospora, I don't know about the spores on their own. I mean, the, the fungus produces amphetamines. It would probably do things to humans, although I, I wouldn't recommend trying it since we don't really know what else is in it. And also, I'm not advising you to do amphetamines. It's not legal <laughs> or uh, a good idea. Um, yeah, if you ate the whole thing, it would definitely do something to you. Uh, behaviorally, it's not a parasite in humans, or it's a less, at least not known to be. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and Rachel Courtney wanted to know, um, she referred to this as, I don't, I don't think you used this term, but um, mycological carnivores and why uh, we as a public know about botanical carnivores, but not mycological carnivores. Oh, like carnivorous fungi? Um, I think part of that, I'm not entirely sure, part of that might be that uh, a lot of fungal carnivory happens kind of on the microscopic level. So for example, some um, oyster mushrooms are carnivores, but they usually do that with little microscopic loops or kind of structures that produce sticky drops. So like if you're looking at a Venus flytrap, um, it can catch a fly and you can see it doing that, but maybe with an oyster mushroom, you're not really gonna see that unless you're looking at, under, at it under the microscope. Maybe that's why, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I find them very interesting and there's, a wide range of fungi that are carnivorous. Yeah, I'd say probably has to do with most of their uh, carnivorous structures being microscopic. Right. Um, and Elizabeth wanted to know when you said, when you say derived basidiomycetes, what you're referring to. Okay, so when I'm saying derived, I'm kind of, um, it's kind of an old fashioned term. So you have like toward the base of a tree, you have a group that's called basal or primitive, and then everything else that's more closely related to each other, those are the derived things. So kind of when I say derived, we're working up the tree to kind of a, a group nested inside that group. So when I'm saying derived basidiomycetes in this context, I'm talking about uh, mostly agaricomycetes, the more and more generally uh, morphologically complex, at least at the naked eye level things. Um, and speaking of the naked eye level um, question, would, would you say that morphological characteristics don't tell us much about relationships of mushrooms, but sure seems helpful for field ID? What is the usefulness of determining the genetic relationships of fungi? Okay, so um, I would say that morphological characteristics can tell us quite a bit about how fungi are related to each other. Although sometimes that's more kind of on like the, the like a smaller scale. So like how uh, species or genera are related to each other. But if you zoom further out, then they kind of, they often have, well, it depends on the group, but sometimes they have less in common uh, other than DNA. Um, I think the usefulness of determining how fungi are related uh, genetically, um, well, I, I guess part of it is because I, I think that uh, on its own is very interesting evolutionarily. You can kind of look at it and say, this is how these probably evolved. You can also use that to determine, for example, if you have a fungus that produces um, like a, an economically important compound, maybe like an antibiotic, the things genetically most closely related to it are more likely to have similar compounds. Um, but that isn't always useful for uh, field identification, you're right. So I think a, a key is generally better if it gets you to a morphological group, even if that's not actually um, like a, a natural group that evolved that morphology together. There's some overlap. But yeah, it, it definitely makes it more complicated to identify mushrooms, even if I find it very interesting. Um, related, maybe you've kind of already answered that with, with that response, but if you were gonna try to organize a display table out of four, would you try to organize it by these DNA focus groups or do you think it is just more practical to organize by morphology? Yeah, I think it's more practical to organize by morphology. Um, 
to a certain extent. I mean, there are like some groups like Rosulales or Thelophorales or Belites where, you know, those are pretty natural groups that are also, you know, pretty morphologically united. But yeah, I would generally go with morphology or broader groups than, uh, yeah, the genetic relationships. Although it is interesting, um, I've seen some people bring like a, a printout of a big tree of fungi and then you can put, you know, some of the mushrooms on that to show. And well, this is how they're actually related to each other. But uh, for organizing things on, uh, on the 4A tables, I think that gets a bit too messy. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about the cuckoo fungus, um, I'm not even sure what this is, but someone was, um, Rick was asking if it's similar to carcinization. Hold on, carcinization? I'm gonna scroll up and see what, um, I, I'm not familiar with that term. Um, Rick, are you here in the, the chat if you wanna, I don't know if you can turn your mic on. Ah. Okay, I don't know. Um, I don't know if this is exactly it, but it might be talking about uh, different genealogical groups re-evolving with uh, the same characteristics. Um, I'm not sure exactly if that's what he was talking about or not. Oh, like uh, okay. convergence? Right. There have been a whole other side chat about that. So maybe yeah, yeah, that might have been what- Sort of. Was. Yeah. I mean, that is kind of uh, convergent broadly in being brood parasitism. There are actually some other fungi that uh, have been recently discovered to do a similar thing. There's like a, a crust fungus in Australia that uh, also has a like a termite tricking behavior. So there is some convergence there, yeah. If that's what you're asking. You um, you mentioned a couple of um, mushrooms having a particular odor, which I I just find super interesting. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, I know with, for example, truffles, you know, there is, uh, they've, they've evolved, you know, to attract um, animals to eat right. in that yeah. sense with the gilled mushrooms and so forth, like the ones that smell like almond or bouillon, um, does it have an evolutionary advantage or is that just a matter of the chemicals that, that uh, produce those odors? Yeah, with a lot of those, we just don't know. I mean, it's very possible that some of them do, but it just hasn't really been studied. Um, so they might, the odor might have some sort of fungi, uh, function in either repelling or attracting animals. Um, although, yeah, in a lot of fungi where we know it has an odor, we can say, okay, the odor is useful in distinguishing it from a different fungus but we don't really know why or how it does it. And that's true, I'd say, of most fungi that smell like something. And in some cases too, it's, it's possible that maybe the odor is like a byproduct of something else, maybe you know, metabolically. Right. But yeah, you, for the most part, we don't know. Um, I'd say truffles are one of the few groups where that's been studied. Yeah. Okay, um, John said, we decided the tree print out of the genetic tree was too big for the display table. Could you go back to one of your pictures of these trees and explain a bit about the numbers that often appear on the lines that lead to nodes? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so let me share my screen and go back. I think I ha might have a picture. Okay, can you share, uh, see my screen right now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I might have one. Yeah, yeah, okay. So usually these numbers are uh, bootstrap support values that kind of tell you in the analysis that they ran how well supported these nodes are, like how many, uh, it's not exactly what it is, but essentially what percentage of the time is this recovered because these trees, um, the program makes uh, usually at least a hundred trees and then kind of aggregates them and you know, says, okay, 
this amount of the time this relationship is recovered. So this is how well supported it is. So for example, a hundred here, that's very well supported. Um, these are mostly well supported in this tree. Something below 50 is not very good. Yeah, okay, there, here's something with no number. So that's probably below 50. So that's probably something where it might not be real. Um, yeah, it's usually, it might not be bootstrap values, but it's usually some sort of statistical value that tells you roughly how well supported those relationships are. Yeah. That's right. I think that's all the questions we have. Okay, um, cool. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Elizabeth. 